All right, good evening. Welcome this evening, glad you're here. Why don't we open in prayer? Well, what a privilege it is once again, Lord God, to come before you, Lord, with your Holy Spirit guiding us and leading us once again. We pray that we would have a wisdom and an understanding from your word and from your spirit, Lord, how to just process the information that you have so graciously provided to us through the scriptures to help us to learn and to grow and to transform our minds and our hearts to be more like you each and every day. I pray that our study tonight would indeed facilitate us coming closer to you and being image bearers, Lord God, who more appropriately reflect your image as we apply what we learn into our lives each and every day. So thank you for this opportunity to gather in your name. Glory to you in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, yeah, we are uh, jumping into Acts chapter 8 tonight. Should be able to do the whole chapter if everything works out according to plan. As a quick review, just kind of get us uh, oriented and settled once again. Just going to kind of do this wherever it feels appropriate. Chapter 1, we have the ascension of Jesus Christ up into heaven 40 days after the resurrection. And, uh, of course, the instructions of the apostles to take the gospel that he, in the message of his word, take that into first Jerusalem and then into Judea, which is the larger region of Israel, if you would call it that, at that day, and then into Samaria. We're going to talk about that part of it tonight, and then into the outermost parts of the earth. Um, And so we will see much of that being fulfilled in a way that really at this point in our study hasn't been. Um, And so in chapter 2, we saw Pentecost and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit or the baptizing in and with the Holy Spirit, the speaking in known foreign languages that ended up with 5,000 people uh, receiving salvation based on how the Holy Spirit was convicting them and revealing truth to them. Chapter 3, we saw Peter and John go into the temple and they are uh, preaching and they get arrested and they spend the night in jail. They come back out. The Sanhedrin, who we keep having these interfaces with, um, listens to them. They command them never again to preach or speak in the name of Jesus Christ, but they tell them they're not, or, or the, you know, and they move on. Um, and that was after the healing of that uh, uh, lame man. Um, and that rolls into chapter 4, and we see them um, ultimately getting, uh, and, and Peter through this has had a couple of sermons, I probably should have mentioned that. Chapter 2, we have a famous first sermon of Peter. Chapter 3, we have the next sermon of Peter, where he uh, makes that confession. Chapter 4, we see the um, uh, outflowing of that, where they end up uh, being told, you know, are beaten, and then move back into chapter 5, and they come back and celebrate uh, the fact that they have um, have been counted, been counted worthy to suffer for the glory of the Lord. Uh, chapter 6 was a kind of a short chapter where we got introduced to Stephen, and Stephen and his six companions were appointed to deal with the Hellenistic widows who weren't receiving the distribution, but Stephen himself was there preaching, probably in the temple, demonstrating the power and the name and the truth about Jesus Christ. That got him arrested, and at the end of chapter 6, he's then brought before the Sanhedrin. Chapter 7 is basically all about Stephen presenting the truth, historically, of how Scripture has a, a prophecy and a pattern of how Israel always rejects God on the first occasion, and we'll receive him on the second occasion. And that's just the pattern that he established with those kind of five different lines of reasoning, starting with Abraham not leaving Ur of the Chaldeans, and, but then later leaving uh, Haran to go into the promised land, and Jacob, um, and, and mostly Joseph, dealing with how Joseph was appointed to be the leader of his family and leader of the nation, and they rejected that the first time, had to receive him the second time. And then we looked at Moses on two different occasions where Moses was a deliverer, but then 40 years have to pass before he comes back, and then they receive him as their deliverer. We talked about the same issue then in the wilderness with the law. God gave him the law, and they kind of refused Moses as the leader until they later received him. And then lastly, we closed out last week with looking at the tabernacle versus the temple and how that was another demonstration of the hard-heartedness and stubborn, stiff-necked, rebellious people that we have here. 
which ended up with, of course, the Sanhedrin running at uh, Stephen, and maybe they appointed you know, certain executioners, we don't know, but ultimately some people in that crowd pick up stones and they begin to stone him. Stephen then um, looks up into heaven, sees Jesus standing at the right hand of the uh, throne of God, and um, he, of course, is martyred, and we saw you know, how martyrdom became um, really redefined based on that information. So. And then we also got introduced, and one of the main points of uh, connecting Stephen to where we're going tonight was that we saw this young man named Saul, and Saul was, um, w- was standing there watching Stephen get, getting stoned, uh, stoned by execution, and um, it says that, they, they, that those who were doing the work laid down their clothes at the feet of Saul, a young man named Saul. And that's kind of where we pick up. It's probably not a perfect chapter break in terms of where they put the chapter. So I'm going to put it as Acts 8.1 is just this one phrase where it says, Now Saul was consenting to his, that would be Stephen's, death. And I want to talk about just that phrase because what follows after is really not connected to the previous thought. So, all right. So we see that Luke recorded that Saul was consenting that to the death. We would call it murder, right? They're murdering him. He's innocent, and they are murdering him through the process of stoning. And he was consenting to that, so he's at least an accomplice to the act of murder. And I want to re- remind us as we study through the book of Acts here that Luke seems to be recording all of the information about the gospel, and the, both in the gospel of Luke and then in the book of Acts, Highly speculative, or somewhat speculative, but pretty well um, asserted by many scholars and theologians, that Luke is writing the court documents to be presented for Paul before Caesar, as Paul makes an appeal to Caesar, as we'll see uh, coming up in multiple chapters down the road. Um, Isn't it interesting, though, that uh, here's Luke. He's trying to put Paul in Paul's best light, who was also Saul, but he's, he's... very honest and accurate about how Saul, prior to his conversion, participated in Stephen's death. So he, the whole point is to pre, seems to be to present Paul as a good guy, not the, not the bad guy in all of this. He's the good guy. He's coming to make an appeal to Caesar on behalf of his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But Luke doesn't omit the detail. He doesn't say, oh, let's not talk about the fact that Saul was consenting to Stephen's death. He actually participated in it in some capacity, and that is open and available for Caesar to evaluate. In fact, it may even be helpful to his case and how opposed he was to Christianity, and now he's the advocate, the chief spokesperson for this new faith that has been produced. And so um, it, might, it may end up serving as a benefit. Of course, we don't see that conversation between Caesar and Paul. But uh, anyway, I just find it interesting, you know, that, that Luke is really uh, writing at the behest of Saul or Paul, and he includes maybe one of his worst um, acts of his entire life um, in, the midst, in the midst of this message he's talking about. All right, Uh, so Paul then, I believe, carried the burden of what he participated in with Saul's, or with Stephen's death for the rest of his life. He'll make mention of it several times, um, and of course we know that he makes those kind of three famous declarations of who he is. I'm the least of the apostles, I'm the least of the saints, and then later as he's writing one of his last letters of his life, he says, I am the chief among sinners, Um, and he makes multiple references to how he participated in the death of Stephen. So um, while he, and and he also is the champion of the, the term grace, right, charis in the Greek, uh, grace, this unmerited favor that God bestows upon us. And the more he recognizes I was a consenting murderer, the more he realizes I could only be received by God by grace. And that's really similar to what you might think of with David. You know, when David writes Psalm 51 after the uh, you know, adultery with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband Uriah and all that happened there, And he writes, you know, he says, like, you know, sacrifice and offering. I can't offer anything because the law doesn't give me a a way of being restored to God after committing adultery or murder. 
but I, I appeal to God's grace, as that's what he does in Psalm 51, and that's what Paul seems to do for all of his life, is to really uh, just trust in God's grace, knowing that it's all about what Christ did on the cross, not what Paul did to Stephen or anything else that he could possibly do that was righteous, that got, that got him access into eternal life. It's what Christ did on the cross for him. All right, so that kind of kind of closes out chapter 7 with eight, chapter 8, what I'm calling 1A. It doesn't probably say that in your scriptures, but I'm calling it 1A. So let's take a look at 1B uh, in this next section. Now, Acts chapter 8, uh, I've got actually in your notes there seven different you know, uh, topic points. And so it's kind of a, a choppy little exercise of this event happens, and then this event happens, and this event happens. You know, so chapter 7 was one big uh, event with Stephen presenting the case before the Sanhedrin. Lots of things are going to happen here in chapter 8. It's kind of getting us warmed up to the place where Saul, Saul or Paul becomes the main character. Um, and so there's a number of transitions. But as we do that, I would say if you're going to give chapter 8 any kind of uh, thematic title, you would be the Acts of Philip, because Philip is the most prominent character from top to bottom in Acts chapter 8. So he's going to take mostly center stage here as we read. Okay, so the first component of this is Acts 8, 1b, if you will. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So these 5,000, 10,000 plus believers have now started to scatter throughout the regions that Christ had told them originally, I'm going to send you to. Um, it seems that just the 12 apostles were staying behind. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made a great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women and committing them to prison. So we saw the, the separation. S Stephen is lamented over and brought to his burial. Paul, or Saul, I should call him here. Saul is vigorously persecuting, severely persecuting the church and doing all he can to either arrest or have killed anybody who is a believer in Christ. So we see that following, seem, seemingly following Stephen's death, this great persecution arose against the church, so much so that they could no longer remain in Jerusalem. Not like they were. Remember, they all had all things in common. They were sharing all things, and the apostles were going from house to house within, in the city to preach and to teach and to break bread among the fellowship. Um, that's all gone now. Like So between chapter 6, when they're distributing... Uh, to the needs of the widows, both the, the Hebrew widows and the Gre uh, Grecian widows. Um, that's all gone now. So at the, by the time we get to this account in chapter 8, the house churches are done, the feeding of the widows is done, all that kind of activity seems to have been you know, taken out, at least in abundance, out of the city or the territory or region around Jerusalem. So all believers, um, as I said, perhaps 10,000 or more. We have no you know, f cumulative count going for us. we got 5,000 saved in Acts chapter 2 and another 3,000 saved in Acts chapter 3. And then daily the Lord is adding to the church great, nu great numbers of people. We don't know how many were, but thousands, 10,000, who knows how many men, women, children are being scattered and forced to flee from Jerusalem. And they end up in Judea. Remember, um, Christ told them in Jerusalem, in Judea, and then off to Samaria. Well, here they are in Acts chapter 8. Because of the persecution, we are now seeing them outside of Jerusalem into Judea. And even we're going to see outside of Judea into the regions of Samaria, which is what God wanted. And he's using persecution to accomplish that within the church. So despite these severe persecutions, um, a group of devout and brave men, I believe, carried Stephen's body so that he would receive a proper burial um, for him, for his body to go into. So he's hated by the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin is probably stirring up every zealous Jew in the territory. But some group of men carried Stephen off to ensure that he received a proper and an honoring burial for a man who died with his last breath giving testimony to the Lord um, to a people that hated him 
but needed to hear the message. So Stephen's passing, what we would call going into sleep, right? It's the sleep of the believer, the body dies, and the soul and the spirit go to be with the Lord. Um, his passing caused a great lamentation. The whole church was lamenting over the passing of Stephen. And we believe this is probably the first death, whether by violence or any other capacity, probably the first death in the church. They had believed on Jesus Christ. They knew that Jesus raised people from the dead. They knew that he is promising them eternal life and all that. And so one can just imagine that they were a bit shocked and a little bit challenged by the fact that Stephen, a believer in Jesus Christ, had died. Now, we know 2,000 years later, believers die all the time. There was never a promise by Jesus that we wouldn't uh, you know, not die in this life. Uh, and, we, or, and there's even promises that we will suffer persecution. And, um, and then we talked when we were looking in Sunday mornings in the book of Thessalonians, we saw like in chapter four there, there was this kind of concern. They fell asleep. They thought the rapture was coming. They thought Christ was coming back. And it was kind of a shock to the Thessalonians there what, that Paul wrote to that believers are starting to die. And so Stephen is the first one, and this is, you know, causing a great lamentation. It, it's not, I'm not going to necessarily equate it because I don't have any information, but it's similar to the kind of mourning that we've kind of witnessed there when Abraham died or when Jacob died back in the book of Genesis, and probably even more so when Joseph himself finally died in Genesis chapter 50. So the church is lamenting the death, just as it's a tragic loss in their eyes, and um, and also an honoring of a truly humble and um, devoted man to the kingdom. Now, while Stephen's ministry was cut short, his legacy lives on in the Christian world, where he, Stephen, is held in the highest regard, I believe, without controversy. I mean, you know, sometimes we talk about the people who not, there's no negative thing said about in the scriptures. Joseph, certainly in Genesis, Daniel in the book of Daniel, but Stephen here, there's nothing negative said about him by anything. He's held in just the highest regard um, and w- seemingly without controversy in the church. He's a great man who truly deserved to have a um, honoring funeral. And for 2,000 years and, and, go, and counting roughly, we see that Stephen is still a man we can look up to. Standing up in the face of overwhelming power, Even against the threat of violence, he was willing to share the gospel with those because he loved them, because he knew the Lord loved them, and he didn't want even his death to be counted against them. He wanted his death to be a witness so that they themselves would be saved. You know, here's an incredible, incredible short life, but because we think he's pretty young uh, when he died, but also just a, what, the, what is recorded in chapter 6 and 7 of Acts is really, really something we can look, look to towards and say Stephen did it exactly the way we should all want to do it. And in fact, uh, so honoring to Stephen are we that we use the term martyr in a different way than its original Greek meaning. Okay? Um, so I mentioned this maybe a, f- a while back, but in Greek, that term is really best understood as someone who witnesses or shares the truth. So when Peter and John go to the temple and they begin proclaiming Christ to the crowds, they're martyring. They are martyrs for Christ. They didn't die. They're just witnessing for Christ. So the term martyr means someone who witnesses of the truth or speak you know, in some kind of capacity of a religious um, message is someone who is pro- making those proclamations. Today, if anyone, even seemingly worldwide, because we hear about martyrs in Islam and all this other kind of religions and whatnot, everybody seems to have adopted this new Stephen definition of being a martyr, which is to die for your faith, die in the witness of your faith, or to advance the cause for your religion. Um, and so we've com- we com- after Acts chapter 7, that word martyr has been completely redefined and used in multiple languages to mean someone who dies for their faith. 
Now Saul um, was obviously not someone who was lamenting Stephen's death, but became intensely zealous. He'll mention this multiple times. He'll mention his zealousness in Romans. He'll mention his zealousness in Galatians. Here in Acts, he will mention it. He's zealous. He's got this fervent hatred for these people who proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. They don't have a, a, an official name yet. We're going to see that they're going to be called the way here fairly shortly. Um, but uh, but they don't have a name. They're not called Christians yet. They're not called the people of the way. They're just these people who won't sh- keep silent about Jesus Christ. And they keep proclaiming him as, uh, pro- proclaiming to be followers of him as the, as the Messiah, right? As a, follow, as a follow-up to the Old Testament prophecies. So um, he's intensely zealous, and he is, he's strongly, every effort he has is to prevent these believers from continuing their witnessing of the name of Jesus Christ. And it says he personally caused havoc. In Greek, that term would be serious or injurious harm upon the church. I mean, this is not just somebody who's like, you know, standing up and, and saying, sit down, shut up, stop talking. I mean, he's, doing, he's committing serious or injurious harm to the church. He's grabbing them. He's arresting them. He's throwing them into prison. He is uh, bringing false accusations against them so that they could be executed under either uh, Jewish law or under Roman law. He's doing whatever he can to, as he says in his own words in Galatians 1, he did all he could to cancel the church, to, to stop the church. He, want, he wanted to see it destroyed. And, um, and so he is zealous for that task. We'll see in chapter 9 why that, that zeal for the wrong thing gets turned into zeal for the right thing on the road to Damascus next chapter. Now, uh, what was Saul doing? He made it his effort, seemingly on a daily basis, to go from house to house and dragging off both men and women if they confessed Jesus Christ. Now, obviously... A Christian could have said, no, I don't believe in Jesus Christ, closed the door and said, ah, oh, got, got past that, now I can go up, continue on and profess faith in Christ. But nope, he's going house to house. Are there any believers in Jesus Christ here? And they would, I think they were boldly saying, yeah, I believe in Jesus Christ. And then he would drag them off. Okay? Um, there seems to be no timidity and no willingness to lie that they weren't followers of Christ. We tend to have a lot more uh, laxal, laxical uh, view of that. We'll just go, well, if somebody doesn't want to hear about it, I'll just keep silent. Or even if they ask me, are you a Christian? I'll say no. And then just go, whew, didn't have to deal with that. Um, where they were, they had serious threats against their personhood. And they would seemingly just open up straight to Paul's face and say, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. And get dragged off uh, for such a testimony. So many of these believers were thrown into prison because of Saul. I mean, many, many, we don't know how many, but it seems that many in Jerusalem, if they weren't scattering and fleeing to save their soul or save their life, not their soul, but their life, um, then they were being dragged off into prison. And I'm assuming that many of them would have been executed by the Sanhedrin because once they got to prison, what were they going to do? They're going to be brought before the Sanhedrin, the ruling council in Israel, and say, are you a believer in this man? And they would say, yes. And well, what are they going to do then? Are they going to keep telling them not to preach in Jesus' name? Are they going to do the same thing they did to Stephen to these, you know, openly, open followers of Christ? And so I think probably many of them died because of Saul getting them at least into prison. If he himself didn't kill any of them, there are certainly records of Christian persecution and you know, both under the Jews and under Romans in the first century that, that Paul would have had a big part in until his conversion. So Saul was not only guilty of participating in his death, but really the blood of countless believers was figuratively on his hands as he was an accomplice to uh, whatever torture or arrest or death was uh, the ultimate outcome for their lives. So Saul was a big player and a, an evil guy when it comes to uh, believers in Christ. All right. So now let's take a look at where Philip picks up in our picture. So starting in Acts chapter 8, verse 4. So we're now looking at the group of, that's scattered. 
whether they were released from Jerusalem or they were fleeing before people got, uh, you know, Saul and his party got to their house. They're scattered. So we're going to see the scattering of these believers. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. They weren't silent. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes, with one accord, heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was, a, there was great joy in the city. So Philip, in the scattering process, travels down to, or up to Samaria, and he, um, down to, down from Jerusalem, everything is down from Jerusalem, but on a map it would be north of Jerusalem, so I think you can say north, up or down either way, but um, it's almost always referred to as down from Jerusalem. All right, so he goes to Samaria and he begins working miracles, signs and wonders, casting out demons, casting out uh, spirits, and he is healing those who are lame and sick in multitudes of capacities. He's having great, great success in uh, the city of Samaria and the, and the region. So these believers who managed to escape Jerusalem during this severe persecution, mostly you know, was, uh, or- orchestrated by Saul, were scattered everywhere. That was in part God's plan um, to use the wickedness of Saul to spread the message of the gospel. These believers, though, as we saw, were not silent concerning their faith. Rather, they preached this truth about Jesus Christ everywhere they went. They were walking, hey, can we get a cup of water? Can we tell you about Jesus Christ? They were looking for lodging. Hey, is there any place of, you know, any land that we can buy around here? Our old homeland is gone. We need a place to live. Hey, can we tell you about Jesus Christ? I mean, they're constantly professing the name and the truth of who Christ is wherever this whole scattering group of 10 plus thousand people went. The name of Christ was getting out into the world the way Christ wanted it to. So the apostles and the Holy Spirit um, equipped the, all these believers, not just Philip, but all of them really, with the knowledge and the power to preach the truth. And none of the apostles, other than what we saw with Philip, were part of it. These were just, they didn't, they didn't need a special office. They didn't need a special anointing, anything else. They were believers in Jesus Christ, and they could go out into the world and they could preach Jesus Christ. And they were. Um, Now, Philip, of course, we know, was one of the apostles, and his journey took him to Samaria, and he had a great effective preaching of the gospel to the city of Samaria. And we saw that here that a great multitude, I mean, it said, it almost basically indicates everybody that he just received, all of Samaria received his message. I'm going to say a great multitude. I'm sure there were some uh, holdouts somewhere. But a great multitude in the city of Samaria accepted what Philip preached about Jesus, and they heeded his instructions about what to do now that they wanted to join this faith that he had been proclaiming to them. Now, Philip's ministry in Samaria also included, as we see here, the demonstration of God's miraculous power, um, of course, his love for the Samarians, which God used then to authenticate Philip's words, right? So um, unclean spirits were cast out of people who were demon-possessed. Great, that got some attention. Uh, However, the unclean spirits were not coming out of people that they were possessing willingly, but they screamed as they were forcibly removed from the victims, right? So Philip comes and he preaches to them and he is ready to cast out these inhabiting spirits. And they're like, no, and whatever they were saying, I don't know, screaming loudly, but he's by the power of the spirit extracting them or, or evicting them from their victims. And, uh, and I don't know where they went, if they you know, went into a herd of swine and fell into the sea or what they did, but he is having great effective success in healing people of any kind of, of disease or uh, spiritual oppression, just like Jesus did. Remember, Jesus said that the apostles would do, you know, as many signs as he was, even more, because they're scattered throughout wherever they could go. And he was, you know, more constrained in his, uh, where he could travel to. 
So F uh, Philip is having a tremendous um, success here. I keep spelling it here with two L's. It's, probably, it's just one, but that's all right. So Philip was able to show God's power to many others uh, who were possessed or paralyzed, and all of whom, it seems like there was no, nobody that Philip said, ah, I can't heal you. I'll have to wait for some reinforcements or anything like that. It seems like when Philip went in, he was, had great success. Everybody who needed healing received it. Everybody who needed to be delivered from an evil spirit was delivered. And so the whole city, it says, was filled with joy as they're witnessing this miraculous power that Stephen has uh, brought to them in the name of Jesus Christ. All right, that'll uh, take us into the, the next section here. So starting in verse 9, pick up the, the account of, of Philip's success there. But there was a certain man called Simon. Uh, and you might recall that Peter also has the name Simon, Simon Peter, Peter, Simon Peter. This is a whole different guy. You know, there's many times we'll encounter somebody named Simon in the study of Book of Acts. Uh, this, is, this is one who's actually a one who practiced sorcery. So anyway, there's a certain man called Simon who previ previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed. And, he was and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and the signs which were done. All right, so now we're encountering this sorcerer named Simon and Philip, the conversion aspects here. It's not going to be a, a flawless conversion for Simon. We're going to see that in a little bit, but at least we got some more evidences of things happening here in Samaria and uh, more opportunities for the Holy Spirit to take authority over which obviously a spiritually uh, oppressed kind of region with what Simon was doing with his sorceries, which of course is illegal and uh, under the law of God and, and you know, <laughs> Uh, eligible for stoning the kind of activities that Simon was engaged in. So uh, these Samaritans, are, including this former sorcerer, believe in Jesus, right? So there's, this, uh, there's active acknowledgement that there's a belief in Jesus, even by a man who was probably right up until the time he encountered Philip, practicing his sorceries. Okay. So the certain man practiced sorcery in Samaria. We would, when it says sorcery, it means like black magic or drawing on demonic power. So we've already seen people are demonically oppressed or, you know, they're filled with demonic spirits. And Simon here is engaging in black magic, which really means he's drawing on the power of Satan, drawing on the power of demons to impress people and probably to fleece them out of their money in the city. And he had a great reputation. They weren't looking for God. They weren't looking for Jesus. In fact, when he's doing these powers, these, these various demonic signs, they are attributing to him being one who's using power from God. They're not saying, oh, he's, he, he's doing demonic things, but we don't care. He, we like it. They're saying this demonic stuff he's doing, they're, they're claiming it was from God himself, Yahweh. Okay. And so they're, they're duped by this man. So what Simon act, was actually great at, in my opinion, was swindling people out of their money. He was great at impressing them with tricks and, and uh, getting demonic forces to get on his side. And he's, getting, he's got a career, a, a, probably a wealthy career, out of getting people to donate to his demonically influenced uh, you know, schemes and powers. So the Samaritans believed that Simon's powers of sorcery caused the people to believe that he was using the power of God. But as I said, he was using power drawn from Satan ultimately. But when Philip came and preached the truth concerning Jesus, a great many of these Samaritans, seemingly you know, the vast majority of them, believed and were baptized. Therefore, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, 
that's in chapter or chapter 8 verse 16 a few verses down the road here they're baptized in Jesus' name now somewhat surprisingly Simon this former sorcerer also believed and was baptized like other Samaritans and we've got some things going on here that we're going to take note of his conversion the sorcerer's conversion to faith really began because he witnessed what actual signs and actual miracles from God look like compared to what he was doing by sorcery. So I want you to think about this man. I don't know how many years he was practicing sorcery, but he's been practicing sorcery. He's got all the people believing that he's got some kind of great gift and power and that he's speaking for God. And then Philip shows up on the scene and and Simon the sorcerer goes, that's real power. I mean, you can see he's really impressed. They're doing things he couldn't even begin to dream of doing. And so he's like, I want to get on that ship. I want to jump over with those guys. They've got real power that, that far surpasses the kind of you know, demonic sorcery and trickery that I was able to do over these past years and make a lot of money on it, more than likely. So his, his conversion to Christ began because he himself, a sorcerer using black magic demonic powers, was ultimately impressed by what God actually can do through a devoted servant like Philip. All right, now here's where we're going to get into the, the kind of the controversy of all, everything that's going on here in Samaria. So the, when the apostles, now starting in Acts 4, 8, 14. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had not fallen upon, uh, had fallen on, upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of hands, the, of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you, because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this, of this, your wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Then Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me, that none of the things which you have spoken may come upon me. So when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. All right, so there's multiple different kind of controversies to kind of look at and unpack here. So what we're seeing here is I think there was a need to authenticate the gospel down, or I'm sorry, up, whichever way you want to look at it, north but down, in Samaria. And the fact that Philip was there alone meant that he needed another apostle to say, wait a minute, it's not just Jewish people, pure, full-blooded Jews who are receiving the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's actually happening in huge numbers in Samaria. And so you might recall, like in the Old Testament, it says by uh, by two or three witnesses, a thing is established. So here's Philip, a full-fledged apostle, but he's all by himself. And I believe they, he needed, we needed, as, as people looking for two or three witnesses of, to, te- to authenticate an event, needed one or two more apostles to come down from Jerusalem to say, wow, the Holy Spirit, there really are believers in Samaria. The Holy Spirit really is active in their life. And so they heard about this, and they, wanted to, they sent Peter and John down to be those who would authenticate, yes, Samaria has in fact received the gospel. Now you might recall from Luke and other places in the gospel that Samaritans and Jews do not associate with one another. 
right? They would, if, if a Jew saw a Samaritan walking down the road, they would move to the other side and try to stay as far away from a Samaritan as they could. They had no direct interaction. That's to say nothing of how they felt about Gentiles. Gentiles were even worse. But Samaritans and Jews had no mutual connection except as it goes all the way back to Abraham um, and, you know, and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all that started it off. So they did have that relationship. When we get to chapter 10 with the Gentiles, all that's off the table. There's no relationship you know, from a lineage back to Abraham when the Gentiles ultimately receive the faith. Here, they still needed to witness. Even though Christ told them in chapter 1, go from Jer- Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria, they, did not, they still needed to authenticate, wow, Samaria really is getting the gospel and can become believers in Christ. So their inclusion in the church, I think, probably has shocked the apostles. Um, but as I said, not as much as when they're going to get shocked in chapter 10 when Cornelius receives, in his household received the gospel. Peter and John found that the Samaritans had a genuine faith but had not yet received the Holy Spirit. And I think they were surprised by this delay. So they were called here. I want you to kind of you know, picture this with me for a little bit. Philip goes to Samaria. He's got an incredibly effective witness. He's preaching the gospel. He's healing people. He's casting out demons. Masses of Samaritans are getting saved and believing in Jesus Christ. Now, apostles up in Jerusalem are hearing about this, and they say, Let's go check this out. This is a brand new thing that we didn't necessarily anticipate that Samaritans would receive the gospel. We need to go down there and authenticate that. And I think when they arrived, they went, well, they seem to be believers, but they don't have the Holy Spirit. Okay? And uh, as we talked about earlier in our study, I think people from a high charismatic, hyper Pentecostal kind of viewpoint go, oh, we see this, it's always this two stage process. I think the apostles were surprised. They were like, that doesn't happen. When we, whenever we're out there witnessing and praying, people, we, we, we pray and people receive the Spirit. It's like this was a special occasion where the Holy Spirit was, the baptism in the Holy Spirit was delayed so that Peter and John could come and witness it for themselves and see, oh, ah, the Holy Spirit is do, doing something new with a new group of people and we get to be those who have witnessed to it. So I think, I think they were shocked and surprised that the Holy Spirit was not already, the baptism of the Holy Spirit was not already accomplished under Philip. So, and it says specifically that Philip had only baptized these new converts in the name of Jesus Christ. So we can conclude that he did not baptize them in the Holy Spirit, right? And so, again, I think we've got something that's intentionally delayed for authentication purposes in order to allow Peter and John, the main well-known names of the apostles, could in fact bear witness to what Philip had accomplished or the Spirit had accomplished through Philip there in Samaria. So when Peter and John then confirmed that the genuineness of the gospel had in fact reached the Samaritans, they immediately laid hands on them and prayed for them to receive the Holy Spirit. Now, it's not stated, but it seems clear that there was some kind of evidence that the Holy Spirit had come upon them when they received the Holy Spirit. Now, did they all speak in a foreign tongue? I don't know. I don't, it doesn't seem like it would be a lot of, of evidence uh, like it was at Pentecost because at Pentecost you had all these different nationalities and, and language groups represented, and in Samaria I'm thinking you don't have that. And so somehow they were manifesting evidences of the Holy Spirit. Could have been tongues. I'm not trying to exclude tongues. But it doesn't say tongues. It says that they were, they were visibly witnessing that these new believers had in fact received the Holy Spirit. Everybody knew it. In fact, Simon the sorcerer could see that these people had received this gift. What it was, we can only speculate. Tongues is, is certainly plausible. But we can't say it was the only evidence because it doesn't say so. Um, In fact, it doesn't seem like it would be a great evidence given the fact that they were probably all, you know, able to speak the language of Samaria and perhaps Greek or whatever. But they would need some kind of other evidence, like a, a, a language they never knew before speaking to somebody who knows that language and saying, oh, you're speaking my language. 
I don't, I'm not certain that you would see that kind of um, circumstances unfold there in Samaria. So, yeah, tongues are possible, but um, there's no proof that it was tongues as the evidence. But when Simon, the, Simon the sorcerer, witnessed what Peter and John had done, he offered these apostles money and requested that they give him the same power of granting the Holy Spirit to come upon whomever he wished. Now, Peter responded really harshly to this former sorcerer. He's probably a sorcerer the day before or a week before, right? It was not like he gave it up 10 years ago. And Peter responded harshly by saying, your money perish with you. Like he's saying, you, you know, what you just did is so, such a, a heresy and a blasphemy, you know, don't be surprised if the Holy Spirit takes your life like he did to Ananias and Sapphira, right? Uh, you know, he's kind of, your money perish with you because you thought that you could purchase the Holy Spirit with money. Um, and so Peter or, you know, calls him out and says his heart was not being led, his heart was being led by his flesh, his desire for money, his de desire for continued fame, his desire for whatever the world had to offer, but he was not, his heart was not ready to surrender and submit to God. He just wanted more power. Like if, you know, the demonic power isn't as impressive, I want the Holy Spirit power. But he didn't want it because the Holy Spirit was active in his heart, he wanted it because it was very profitable. If he could spend a thousand dollars to make a million dollars, he was willing to spend a thousand dollars to get the Holy Spirit power given to him by Peter. Now, Peter did not claim that, in, like he didn't say, look, we're, we're apostles, you're not. Only apostles can give the Holy Spirit. That's not what Peter said. Peter didn't say that only apostles can convey the Spirit or baptize people in the Spirit. Right? Instead, he stated that the Holy Spirit could not be purchased with money. Your intentions are wrong. Your desire is wrong. Your heart is out of line. So uh, Peter then called on Simon. This is a great loving thing to do here. He called on Simon to repent from his wickedness and ultimately to pray that God would forgive this iniquity that was emanating out of his evil heart that he wanted to purchase the Spirit with money. And then Peter even further rebuked Simon by stating that he had been poisoned by, and by bitterness and he's been bound by iniquity. Like, you may have made a confession of Christ and that's a good start, but you have not repented of all of your former practices. They are still deep in your heart and you are still acting on those fleshly sinful impulses and, and you're not willing, you're not demonstrating a willingness to surrender to the Holy Spirit in your actions. So to me, it appears from the passage that Simon gave intellectual consent. Like, ah, I believe that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament Messiah. He's God's son. He's the Messiah. He's, he can do miracles. I've watched these miracles be done. Intellectual assent or consent that Jesus is the Son of God. And, he, of course, he was very impressed by the miraculous power he watched Philip and maybe Peter and Paul, or Peter and, uh, and, and John, you know, bringing to the city there. But he has not yet repented of being a sorcerer. And he has not repented of his reliance on demonic power to gain him wealth and influence in the city. So... In my mind, Simon, the sorcerer, made very little distinction between Jesus, the Lord of the universe, and satanic power that he once previously was drawing on in order to make his living. He's like, they're two of the same thing. This guy's maybe better than this, but they're basically the same. I think he, he's not finding major distinctions between the Lord Jesus Christ, who I'm supposed to surrender and submit to and get my life in line with, and those demons that I was in bed with, making money with, a day ago, a week ago, whatever that former activity was. So that's not, that, you know, we don't mix Christ with de demons. We don't mix Christ with our old life. We've got to put it all aside and we've got to live for Christ. We've got to surrender and submit to Christ. And Simon clearly has not made that transition. And Peter is, is calling him out for his lack of true repentance, lack of true faith that should define that of a new believer. And I think Simon appears shocked and fearful at what Peter said. Like he had no idea, but 
offering money to buy the Holy Spirit was wrong. And when he heard what Simon, when, when he heard what Peter says, I get Simon, Peter, I get mixed up myself here. When, when Simon heard what Peter said, uh, he, he seemed shocked and really fearful. Whoa, I'm in trouble here, right? I think that was really good for him to hear that. Um, and, but he also heard that if he repented and accepted with genuine faith, he, he could be praying to the Lord to be restored or praying for the, those sins to be forgiven him. So while Peter instructed Simon to pray, Simon says, Peter, pray for me, right? And he's like, I need some help here. And I don't think that's necessarily, a, a, you know, a sin in his own actions there. He's looking for guidance and assistance on how do I get myself out of this wickedness that I've just exposed uh, to Peter. So really, to me, it's unclear from the passage whether Simon the sorcerer repented and settled into a proper life of faith or if he remained close to believing in Jesus Christ but never actually changed his heart as Peter instructed him. We don't know. He says, so Simon says, you know, you know, your money perish with you. This is a great wickedness you've committed. Pray that you'll be forgiven effectively. And he turns around and says, will you pray for me? I need to be forgiven. Um, but I can't conclude Oh, absolutely. Simon, the so former sorcerer, made a, a true conversion, confession of faith, received the Holy Spirit, and all of those old things had gone away. I, I can't give you that as an outcome, but I hope so. I hope he got the message. I hope that fear that Peter instilled in him really transformed him away and to, to completely abandon satanic, demonic influences and a heart that was committed to greed rather than under being surrendered to Christ, I hope all of it went away. But I can't necessarily conclude that from the passage. So uh, after this event, Peter, then, Peter and John go and preach the gospel to the new believers um, to establish the foundations of their faith. So Philip had got them accepting Christ, now Peter and John are giving them the solid foundation upon which to build a life of faith, telling them about Christ in the Old Testament, telling them about Christ in the cross, telling them about the atonement and the sacrifice that Christ has made on their behalf, laying this foundation, telling them about the power of the Holy Spirit and the gifts that he's given them to lead the church. Um, so Philip opened the door, Peter and John come in and really uh, build up the church this, you know, milk-drinking juvenile church, they begin to give them a support system so that they can move forward in a proper belief system and faith rather than, um, than letting it be so shallow that it's gonna get, they're going to get dragged away from the faith very quickly. So then they went to many, so after they're done, they themselves, Peter and John, go to many Samaritan villages outside the city, but villages on their way back to Jerusalem, and they're preaching everywhere they go. So it was like, oh, well, we had to travel to, to Samaria to see what Philip has accomplished down there. But on our way back, we're going to stop over here, and we're going to preach the gospel. We're going to stop over here, and we're going to preach the gospel. We're going to stop over here, and we're going to preach the gospel. They were preaching the gospel wherever they went, even though they had a destination to get them back to Jerusalem. And Samaria here, I believe, in, in, as I'm reading the text here in chapter 8, that Samaria is just one example of how the persecution of the church led to a massive surge in spreading the gospel around the Roman Empire. Samaria is important because it was listed by Jesus. You go to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, and so we're seeing the, the direct, overt, Holy Spirit fulfillment of Samaria receiving the gospel, but it says they got scattered everywhere. These t thousands of Christian believers got scattered everywhere and I think that Samaria is just one representative example of how, like wildfire, the name of Christ was starting to spread out into all um, of the Roman Empire territories. Okay, let's move into this next section, starting in verse 26. And this is going to, we're going to deal here with our um, Ethiopian uh, eunuch, which is a, closes out the chapter, but it's a big part of it. I want you to see what's happening here. Now the angel, I'm sorry, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, arise and go toward the south 
along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, had come, uh, come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Did I do that or did I skip one? No, I, okay. I'm sorry. Um, okay, let me go back. <laughs> I think I skipped one too many. Yeah, this is desert. Uh, oh, no, okay. Uh, and sitting in his chariot, he went and reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him, heard him reading the prophet Isaiah, and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they came out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. All right. There's a good number of things going on here. We want to catch, uh, see what's going on. So here Philip was in Samaria, And an angel appears to him and speaks to Philip, instructs him to go south along the road that connects Jerusalem to Gaza. And the area where he was instructed to go was deserted, um, not conducive to supporting life. So you'd only pass through it. You wouldn't find people living there or cities there. It's rather remote or desolate um, in terms of its ability to support life. So Philip did exactly as he was instructed. He encounters this eunuch from Ethiopia uh, riding his chariot. I want to talk about him for a moment. This eunuch was an official uh, gr- with power granted to him by Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. Um, now, first couple of things. Um, in ancient times, uh, people who served at a king's or royal or queen's court uh, were, were called eunuchs. And in fact... Many of them were, in fact, males who were castrated so they could serve at the harem. But over time, the the word eunuch could mean just somebody who serves as a royal servant in the king's court. It doesn't necessarily mean, I don't know if it matters to anybody in the room, but, you know, it it, it doesn't necessarily mean that he had been emasculated. It means that he had a position of authority with the royalty of Ethiopia. Um, so you can read it either way. It's a, he's a eunuch by title or eunuch by physiological description of what they did to him um, or to, to himself or anything else. But speci- we're told specifically that this man, this Ethiopian eunuch, was in charge of the treasury of all the wealth of Ethiopia. He's a high-ranking, powerful man okay, um, oh, in Ethiopia. And he also appears to have been a proselyte to Judaism because it says that he intentionally traveled to Jerusalem to worship the God of Israel. Now, he wasn't a Christian at this moment. He's, a, he's probably a proselyte who has believed in the God of Israel, Yahweh, and is probably traveling to Jerusalem in order to worship him. So, again, as Luke is our author here, doesn't tell us directly, but it seems likely that he was probably traveling to Jerusalem 
to attend one of the three annual feasts that you would find occurring on an annual basis, obviously, in Israel, as prescribed by God to Moses, right? You have three feasts in the spring, you have Pentecost in the middle, and you have the three feasts in the fall. And you might recall that, of course, Jesus was crucified on Passover, and, of course, the Feast of Unleavened Bread and all that is associated with that same grouping of feasts in the spring. And then 40, 50 days later, ultimately, you have Pentecost, and that's where we got the outpouring of tongues. And we haven't seen any time markers anywhere in here except this. So it's, it's probably not likely but possible that the very next feast would have been like the Feast of Trumpets in the fall or the Feast of Tabernacles that he was traveling to worship God for. So if that's the case, this is like just a few months after, all, like after Pentecost. I think most scholars would say it was probably a different feast, a different festival, but we haven't seen the passage of time here. We've only seen a couple of days. We've only seen a couple of events, and we don't know for sure. So I don't think you can date this event uh, based on what we see here in Acts chapter 8, but I believe one of those feasts is in view here. I mean, whether it's spring feast, Pentecost, or fall feast, the, this eunuch was probably traveling to get, like Paul would travel, to get to Jerusalem for Passover or for uh, uh, Day of Atonement or whatever, we would see this eunuch traveling there for at least one of these feasts would be my guess. Yeah. Well, I would say because he's a powerful man, he could afford to buy a manuscript copy of a scroll and because he was a he was a devoted follower of Yahweh, he could say, "I can't be in Jerusalem all my life, but I can take the scroll of Isaiah, or I can take certain Old Testament scrolls, buy a copy of them, and carry them off to Jerusalem." Yeah. Um, now, of course, when we, when I say that, like we're talking about the Septuagint, the Greek translation, more than likely that's what he was had as some kind of a Greek translation. So it may have been on parchment, not not a scroll or whatever, but. Yeah, I think someone with great means, uh, you know, like, like the synagogues, like we saw Jesus when he, and, and Luke chapter 4, when he reads from a scroll in the synagogue. He's not at the temple. He's in a synagogue up in Galilee, and, you know, they have scrolls of the Old Testament there. And so those with the means could afford to make sure that the word of God was in their city or the community. He obviously has one he can carry with him in a chariot back and forth to Ethiopia. But, I, but commonly available, I would say not unless you're really rich. Yeah. So um, Philip, of course, as I said, did what he was instructed. He, got, he caught up to this eunuch. He heard what he was reading as he's like running alongside. Um, and then he asked the eunuch if he understood what he was reading. And, and he's, uh, like I said, all while he's running alongside the chariot that's in motion. The eunuch then confessed that he did not understand the passage and needed someone to guide him through the proper and correct interpretation of what Isaiah had written. And the eunuch then invited Philip to sit with him up in the chariot. I'm assuming that's probably a, you know, a fairly um, you know, unusual account that you would allow him to come up into a royal chariot, just this guy running alongside. But God wanted to connect these two men together and this, this very wealthy and important eunuch from Ethiopia invited Philip, a, you know, who knows what his occupation was, a fisherman or whatever, um, before he became an apostle, uh, gets invited up and sits with him. Now, he's only reading like two, well, we would say two verses out of Isaiah, but Isaiah 53, um, and if you know, Isaiah 53 is one of the main, main, main passages that demonstrates that Christ is the Messiah from the Old Testament written a thousand or 700 years before he's born or whatever. Um, and as I said, he's, uh, the, the version that he quotes or that Luke records that he quoted was from the Septuagint version, which I, you know, use the same den, uh, denotion here of LXX, meaning 70, is the Septuagint version, the Greek translation of the Old Testament text. And, uh, and that text, that Septuagint version does, in fact, differ a little bit from Isaiah 53, verses 7 and 8 that we would find, like in our English translations, if you brought your Bibles or devices with you today. And I'll read that to you in just a moment. But it should sound and look really familiar. 
Um, but the re- either way, whether you're reading Septuagint or English or Hebrew, the reference to Jesus is very apparent no matter which translation you're looking at. So Isaiah 53, 7 and 8, let me just read that to, from you from the New King James, English translation. It says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, and he was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living, that means he died, uh, for the transgressions of my people he was stricken. So that's the passage. If you're familiar with Isaiah 53, I want to orient you to what was being read, even though it's a slightly different wording in the Septuagint to, to English translation. So this eunuch, who's very studious, very interested in following God, he's a devout worshiper of Yahweh, uh, recognized that the writing referred to a very significant and noteworthy death of a man, not the nation of Israel, as Israel would like you to believe if you talk to a Jew today. He recognizes it's a death of a man, or a man who's being referred to. But he wasn't clear, was Isaiah this prophet from 700 years ago writing about himself? Or was he writing about someone who would come after him? Was it prophecy or was it just a narrative of account of a historical th- event? Um, and so he's, he's trying to get Philip to answer his questions about who's, who's being written about here. It's obviously very significant. <laughs> and it's very significant because it's, it's what's opening the door. He's got basically the Holy Spirit has put on this eunuch's heart. You need to know more about this servant that... Isaiah wrote about. His name is Jesus, and Philip's right there to tell him, let me tell you about the servant of God, Jesus, that Isaiah wrote about. So obviously Philip immediately understands and recognizes that the passage that the eunuch had read to him was a clear reference to Jesus out of Isaiah 53, and began then to open, it says, the scriptures of the Old Testament so that Philip could preach Jesus to this Ethiopian eunuch. Okay. Now, we don't know what he preached to him, but we can take some guesses at think of what I would consider to be the highlights of what I would preach to a Jew if they wanted to learn about Jesus from the Old Testament. Um, and I would say he probably went to passages like Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman will crush the, the head of the serpent, right? The proto-evangelistic statement there in Genesis 3.15. Genesis 22, the offering of, of Isaac by Abraham, the father offering the son on Jerusalem and all that went across there and how that foreshadowed God the father offering God the son on the mountain um, on the cross. Okay. Psalm 22 is like a, Jesus is hanging on the cross, like he's writing or he's speaking in first person saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And worms have surrounded me and the dogs of Bashan and, you know, my hands and feet, they pierce my hands and my feet and all that happens there. I'm sure Psalm 22 would come up in this description to the eunuch about how the Old Testament has been proclaiming Christ for hundreds, hundreds of years or even more than a thousand years. Um, Psalm 110, you are a priest on the order of Melchizedek, and uh, your people shall be volunteers and all that. Isaiah 53, of course, if you read the whole chapter, Isaiah 53, you get the fullness of who Jesus is, the suffering servant. And then I would also include like Daniel 2, the stone cut without hands that comes and destroys the kingdoms of man from Babylon to to, um, Medo-Persia to Greece and to Rome and all of that. And same thing in Daniel chapter 7 and then Daniel chapter 9, you have this incredible, or Daniel 7, you have this incredible vision of um, one like the Son of Man coming and standing before the throne of him who has, uh, you know, uh, gray hair uh, sitting on the throne, God and all that. Uh, So clearly Jesus is the Son there. And then Daniel chapter 9 is also uh, another picture of the Messiah who's yet to come, who would be cut off for uh, the nation of Israel. So those are just, you know, uh, uh, six or seven different verses that I would take the eunuch to if he asked me to explain Jesus from the Old Testament. There's obviously plenty more, but those are the big ones that stand out. So the eunuch clearly believed in Jesus. So as Philip is explaining this to him, he clearly believes that Jesus is the Messiah as presented as the fulfillment of these Old Testament prophecies about him. 
So he's, he believes in the study, the Bible study that Philip gives him. And looking out the chariot, he sees some water near, as they approach Gaza or somewhere in that region. And he, remember I told you they were in this deserted place when he kind of caught up to them, this, you know, arid, you know, inhospitable desert. Well, now they're approaching, the Bible study has taken them into some places of near Gaza where there would be water, Mediterranean Sea or whatever. And, um, and so he's clearly a believer in the gospel by the time they see that water. And so, uh, and he asked him, you know, what prevents me from being baptized? I see water, can I get baptized? Okay. And Philip gave the eunuch the condition that would qualify him to be baptized and to become part of the church. He needs to believe with all of his heart. Okay. He said, that, if, I, if you sit, tell me you believe with all of your heart that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is the Christ, I will baptize you. Um, and the eunuch openly stated that he believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. So upon this confession, the two men exit the chariot, go down to the water, and Philip baptized him there. And once the eunuch came out of the waters of baptism, the Holy Spirit caught Philip away. We call that the harpazo, right? Like it's like snatch him away. It's the same word that we saw in 1 Thessalonians 4.17, the snatching away. He was there with him one moment, and he then, they says, he was carried off to Azotus in Ashdod. Uh, which is, or which is also called Ashdod. Now, I want to ma- make mention. Now, you would say the eunuch isn't he a Gentile? Yes, certainly not a Samaritan, certainly not a Jew. But remember, he was a prosel. I believe the text it indicates he was a proselyte. And so, when we talk about you know, ultimately in chapter ten, the gospel going to the Gentiles, you, you might go, well, what, what about the eunuch? He was a Gentile. Yeah, he was a Gentile who converted to Judaism, who converted to Christianity, okay? We're going to see, again, in chapter 10 with Cornelius, it's a couple of weeks away. i got to talk to you about that in a second. Um, you talk about Cornelius, that is a true conversion of a Gentile with no prior relationship to Judaism. And that's going to shock the entire uh, apostolic community. The apostles are going to be shocked by that, and they have to have the big council in Acts chapter 15 to sort out all the information about, whoa, if the gospel is going to the Gentiles, what does that mean for the Gentiles, and what does that mean for the Jews? Okay. So he's a, he's a Gentile convert, but by way of proselytizing to Judaism. Okay, I hope that doesn't confuse anybody. We'll keep sorting those things out as we get further and further down the road. But again, I want you to see in just one chapter here, the gospel has, in fact, it was kind of wholly huddled in Jerusalem for the first six chapters. And then Stephen gets martyred, and it goes to Samaria, and it goes obviously out in Judea, various other communities, it goes to Samaria, and now we've hit an Ethiopian eunuch, and we're setting the stage for it really infiltrating the whole Roman Empire um, and beyond the whole world, just as Jesus had appointed it to. Um, and then when F- Philip gets to, uh, you know, gets to Az- uh, Azotus, he doesn't stop preaching the gospel. He's, he's there, he's, in, he's up there in what we call Ashdod or Azotus, near, on his way to Caesarea, uh, which is basically a north to south trek through the heart of Israel. So uh, I did have a map here. You probably can't see city names or anything on it. But um, they were traveling first from Jerusalem. It goes down here across this kind of deserted highway or deserted area. Hits over into Gaza. I don't see a whole lot of water on our map, so I'm wondering if the water he got baptized in here was the Mediterranean. I don't know. Um, and then after, immediately after, somewhere over here, in, uh, in the baptism of the eunuch, he jumps up here to Ashdod. So, you know, I don't know, I think 30 miles or something north. Now, that doesn't sound like a huge jump. It's not a hyperspace jump, you know, all the way over across the world. But he may have gone instantly, you know, one second he's in the water with a eunuch, the next second he's up here in Ashdod or Azotus. Um, what's that? Yeah, yeah. Got some frequent flyer miles on that one. Um, all right, so I just wanted to see that on the map there. Now, as we close out here tonight, I want to show you um, three examples of baptism. Is that showing up on my screen? Okay, no, good. Um, three examples of baptism. If you've caught it here, 
There's three different baptisms that we've witnessed here in Acts chapter 8. Just to add more confusion and complication to the subject of baptisms, what they are and what they're not in here in the book of Acts. Okay. So there's three different mediums of baptism. Philip, as we saw, went to the city of Samaria, went to the Samaritans, and baptized them upon their belief in Jesus Christ. He baptized them in the name of Jesus Christ. That doesn't sound wrong to me. It sounds perfectly fine. He baptized them in the name of Jesus Christ. But when Peter and John get there, they recognize that these, these new believers did not have the Holy Spirit. They had not been baptized in the Holy Spirit. So Peter and John have this secondary encounter with them, and they baptize that whole group of believers in the Holy Spirit. And as I said at the time, I think they surprised them that the Holy Spirit had not been poured out, that there, were, that there was any possibility that somebody could get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and not be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Um, but I think that was for authentication purposes. Right? And then we see here Philip with the Ethiopian eunuch baptize him in water after this a, a heartfelt confession of faith. So you go, well, which is it? Do I baptize people in the name of Jesus Christ or do I not? Do I baptize people in the Holy Spirit or do I not? Do I baptize people in water or do I not? Why not do it all, right? Um, and, and I don't believe that Acts chapter 8 is trying to, to proclaim a specific model or pattern or approach to baptism. It's just telling us that when people believe that the person who's bringing the gospel message to them is free to baptize them, you got to do it in the name of Jesus Christ, because if they don't believe in Jesus Christ, you're going to baptize them into something wrong, right? But we know that every believer is the temple of the Holy Spirit. There's an infilling of the Holy Spirit when we make a profession of faith in Christ, so we should baptize them in the name of the Holy Spirit. And why not throw in the Father in the mix of all of that? Because Jesus said, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So let's baptize them in all of that. And water is still included here. And I think, you know, in this case, this eunuch, as I mentioned several weeks ago, uh, you know, when a proselyte, from, a Gentile proselyte would come to Judaism, it was very customary to baptize him in water. So here's this Ethiopian eunuch who's a proselyte. He needs to be baptized in water as far as Philip is concerned. So you got all three of these different mediums of, of baptism, right, that are happening here. And, and I, don't, I can't make a doctrinal statement based on what we see here in Acts chapter 8 in terms of, oh, well, there's a secondary experience, as the Pentecostal grouping might say. I, I think it's just there, there, there's various reasons. So let's talk about a couple of things here. The delayed reception of the Holy Spirit in Acts 12 because they were only baptized in the name of Jesus, I believe was most likely for the benefit of Peter and John as to be witnesses for themselves, that two or three witness requirement, that the Holy Spirit would in fact be granted to the Samaritans. That's the only real reason I can conclude why the delay occurred. Okay? Peter and John needed to see that, just like Peter needs to see Cornelius get saved in Acts chapter 10. The water baptism of the eunuch was consistent with the proselyte practice already occurring in Jerusalem at the time. Um, and it does not appear to me that Luke is trying to explain a doctrine of baptisms. Rather, he's just giving us record, a recording of events as each baptism description occurred. At, you know, Early in Samaria, secondarily in Samaria, and third with the Ethiopian eunuch near Gaza. Yeah. Yeah, I think, for, but for mo I mean, there, it, it's, it's reminiscent, let's put it this way. So when the priests, who only priests can go into the holy place, when they go in, they needed to wash themselves ceremonially to demonstrate that they were pure or ceremonially cleansed. And now, even, you know, a, somebody from the tribe of Judah or Benjamin or, you know, a, a Naphtali or whatever, they couldn't go into the temple. And so there's this kind of a sense of, I want to get right with God. And so there's kind of a ceremonial, like John the Baptist, you know, for the remission and repentance of sins. You can take an animal to the temple or the tabernacle, 
and you know get the priest to do that for you. But if you want to go under the waters, you can't go into the the bronze laver and get washed. But you can go to the Jordan River and John or whoever can baptize you. So I think that was a practice that was somewhat employed prior to John the Baptist. And we do believe that historical documents indicate that true proselytes to Judaism would in fact go under water baptism, a full immersion in water, to say, okay, now I'm ready to follow your God instead of my pagan world's gods. And so it was happening, but it's really under John the Baptist and then launching forward into the New Testament where we truly see water baptism. Uh, but again, we, we, we see multiple occasions where water is not referenced, where water is referenced, where the name of Jesus is referenced, and in the Holy Spirit is referenced. And, and we, we can see that it doesn't necessarily seem like they always cross over. But I, I think from a, if, we're, if I'm going to build a doctrine of baptisms, my doctrine is I want to put people in the water for repentance of sins. I want to baptize them in the name of, of Jesus Christ upon a profession of Jesus Christ. And I want to baptize them in the power and authority of the Holy Spirit to fill them to receive every spiritual gift that he has for them. And, of course, I don't want to leave the Father out, so I want to be consistent with Matthew 28 and say, baptizing you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so that, to me, covers all the bases and ensures that a new believer gets the full weight of whatever God is doing spiritually in the baptism without missing anything. And I don't think there has to be a delay. And, and uh, there's a couple of things I want to, last thing I want to say here, um, like in letter E here under number seven, there was no recorded change in the faith level or the maturity level of the Samaritan converts. Peter and John come down and they didn't go, well, let's wait and see if you guys are maturing to the point where we can baptize you in the Holy Spirit. I think they got there and went, well, we don't see evidence of the Holy Spirit in these people. Let's baptize him in the Holy Spirit. And they asked, Phil, Phil, you know, Phil, I baptize him in the name of Jesus. Let's baptize him in the Holy Spirit. There was no change in their status. Um, my understanding was, like I said, you know, the charismatic Pentecostal side is if they're going to advocate for that secondary experience, it's because a person has matured to a point where they are ready to receive the new infilling of the Spirit. And we don't see that even in this proof text for that particular viewpoint. All we see is that they didn't have it, and they got it immediately as soon as they were uh, the recognition that the Spirit needed to be given to them. So they came, and they, the change uh, occurred because they needed the Spirit, and the invocation of the Spirit was done in connection to the name of the fact that they'd already professed Jesus Christ as their Savior. Um, now, I'm going to connect this, I think, you know, Perhaps Jesus, when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, Nicodemus in John chapter 3, he talks about two different mediums, water and spirit. You might remember this, right? Jesus answered to Nicodemus, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Well, water of baptism and repentance sounds right on the spot on. And of the Spirit. Now, Jesus is saying, I will baptize you in the name of the, or in the Holy Spirit. And he's telling Nicodemus, unless you're baptized in the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so I, I think there's some things going on here that says water baptism is, is you know, it's not salvific. It doesn't change a person's salvation. But it's important as an outward demonstration of repentance and identification with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we can't neglect that everybody needs to be baptized in or with the Holy Spirit because that's what Jesus told his disciples he would do and it's what Jesus told his disciples they should do. It's what he told Nicodemus must be done to enter the kingdom of heaven. So let's baptize new believers or anybody who needs it in water baptism and let's make sure that we also declare that I'm baptizing you in the Holy Spirit to be filled with with his purposes for you. Yeah, Maureen. Right. Right. Oh, I don't think this, I mean, my guess is, I'm not, I'm not trying to argue one way or another, but my guess is the Samaritans were probably not baptized by John. There was, again, this 
wide chasm between Samaritans and Jews. And so my guess is the Samaritans weren't baptized by John, but I can't prove it. It's just my best guess based on what I see. But it's, it, it, that's a good thought. I mean, no matter what, I don't think it hurts. You know, there's this, there was, <laughs> there's Churchill divide over anything, right? There, in, you know, a, a few hundred years ago, there was this Anabaptist um, division where, you know, they called them the rebaptizers. If somebody wanted to get baptized a second time, some people thought it was absolute heresy to baptize them again. I think if somebody goes, I feel like I've walked away from the Lord, I want to repent, I want to go back under, I want to make a public profession of faith, why would we not? Um, but some people, in, at least in ancient times, if not maybe still today, would call that heresy that you would ever baptize somebody a second time. I don't see a problem with it. But I, I mean, I think for the most part, we don't have to think about that. If you've been baptized, if you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, you don't have to go through it over and over and over and over again. But there's certain people that it would be such a healing process to their heart and their spirit. They've walked away for five years, 10 years, 20 years, and they go, I want to get baptized because I really now have a heart for God. Let's do it. I, that's, that's my opinion, and I don't think God would. Personally, I don't think God says, ah, you can't do that. That's, you've already done it once. And I certainly don't count the sprinkling of an infant or something like that as being baptized. So, All right. Um, water baptism is a, is a repentance baptism, and the spirit baptism is an empowerment baptism to serve. And both are biblical. Both are essential, although not salvation. You know, it's not tied to salvation, but they're essential. And both can be administered, I believe, simultaneously by any believer to any convert. You don't have to be a priest. You don't have to be an apostle. You don't have to be a pastor. Any believer can baptize any other believer. Um, and they should be baptizing them you know, in, in water when it's appropriate and certainly with the Holy Spirit. Um, and so you know, the only thing, the consistent message there has to be a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. We certainly don't need to wait for Peter and John to show up to baptize us in the Holy Spirit, right? We don't need that. We just need a believer to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Any last comments on any of that? Yeah, I'm going to assume that he was baptized, that Philip baptized. I, I bet Philip learned from, you know, the Samaritan thing that it was okay for him to baptize in water and baptize in the name of Jesus and to baptize in the Holy Spirit. So if there was any confusion, I bet what happened a few verses earlier in, up in Samaria was probably, uh, you know, made sure he baptized this eunuch in the Holy Spirit as well. N no, no. There's, I mean, all, all we can do is infer based on what we, you know, believe would be the appropriate response in those situations. Um, last thing is what I was going to mention at the top of our class, and I'll just mention now. We'll have class next week, but the week following, I'll be out of town at a pastor's conference, so I won't be here on October 8th. So we won't have class that night unless somebody else wants to take over and teach. So, yeah. Um, anyway, have a wonderful evening. Thanks for coming, everybody.